Hello everyone, this is Logan, and today I'm going to be showing you how you can translate any video game playable in RetroArch using the power of AI. Now before we begin, there are a few prerequisites. Obviously you're going to need RetroArch. I'm using version 1.20, which is the latest version as of me recording this video. Now, this feature has been around for a couple of years now, so if you're running a slightly older version, this should still work. However, I just recommend updating to the latest version just for optimal performance and stability. Next, you're going to want to have a consistent and stable internet connection. So the way this works is it essentially takes a screenshot of whatever game you are playing. It fetches data, um, brings it to a server somewhere, and then brings back your translation. And as you can imagine, that requires an internet connection. So I mention this because RetroArch exists on a lot of different systems. Ancient Windows 98 machines, GameCube, PS2, original Xbox, um, the original PlayStation, the, the, the PlayStation Classic, uh, cheap Android and Linux boxes, handhelds you can get on Amazon and AliExpress and things like that aren't going to work unless they have a consistent and stable internet connection. And to that point of stability, if you have something that has an internet connection, like say a Wii, Wii U, 3DS, but it's not like all that powerful... It might work, but just don't bank on it. I would recommend anything less powerful than a Nintendo Switch probably isn't going to work. Or like a semi-modern cheap netbook. Basically, I would recommend try this on like a PC, a Mac, a semi-decent Linux-powered PC... Uh, Steam Deck, which is what I'm running, uh, the, the PS5, Xbox One, Xbox Series, Switch, something like that, you should be pretty good to go. Anyway, with all of that out of the way, first thing we're going to want to do to get this working is we're going to go to Settings, and we are going to go to Configuration. So you are going to make sure that save configuration on quit is set to on. This is not available, uh, this is not set on by default, or at least it wasn't for me. And that is going to be pretty annoying. Uh, basically, you're going to be tinkering with a bunch of different settings, and you're going to want it to actually save those settings. So, turn this to on, and it should automatically save on quit. So, next, what you're going to want to do is go down to accessibility, and then go to AI service. Now, here there are a bunch of different options you're going to want to mess with. First of all, obviously, AI service enabled, you're going to want to set that to on. Uh, AI service output, I'll mention that in a second, but AI service URL, you are going to want to type in what is displayed here, which is HTTP colon slash slash ztranslate.net forward slash service. Type that in as exactly as it is written here, and it should work. Uh, if it doesn't work, try just resetting RetroArch a couple of times, and it should work. Uh, pause during translation. I've not had luck with that. A lot of times what it does is it'll pause, but it won't actually... Uh, bring the translation. So, you can try that, and if it works for you, more power to you, but to me, this feature is just kind of inconvenient, so I leave it off. Uh, source language. So, 
it'll be set to default. Uh, you can set it to all sorts of different languages. Uh, wow, look at all of these languages. I mean, we've got English, Spanish, Espanol, uh, French, Italian, German, Japanese, uh, Bengal, Albanian, a whole bunch of different things. Uh, Portuguese, but you can just uh, set the source language to default and then target language, same deal. A whole bunch of different languages that you can scroll through and find whatever it is uh, is your desired target language. Now, AI service output this is, you know what, I'll, I will show this off uh, once we actually test AI translation working. So next thing we're going to want to do is we're going to want to go to input. This is pretty important. And we're going to want to go to hotkeys. So by default, it's not going to do anything unless you assign it a hotkey. For me, I have it set to here, uh, I have it set to button two, which is essentially the, oh God, I think it's the Y button, I think is how it's configured on the Switch Pro controller. But you can set it to whatever you want. You could also set it to a keyboard button. Um, I recommend something like the control button or the alt button or one of the function keys or something like that. Something that's kind of out of the way. This is set to button two, and I also have it set to where you have to hold down the select button to do any sort of command. Because um, I have a couple of uh, hotkey commands set up on my controller, and I don't want them interfering with just normal functions that you would do with the controller. So you have to hold down select and then do whatever uh, command you have assigned to what button. So, now that we've said that, we are going to go to load content. Uh, you're going to go to just wherever you've saved your games. Uh, it is this, I believe. Yep. Uh, emulation. ROMs. And I will just go to... Let's go to uh, Super Famicom, just so that, you know, we're pretty sure this is going to be a Japanese language. And let's go to uh, let's go to Final Fantasy V. That's a game that, well, it has a bunch of uh, it has a bunch of like fan translations as it is, which are going to be better. I will get into that, but let's just use the original Japanese version just for the sake of demonstration. So let's do that. We will use, you can use whatever emulator you want. It doesn't depend on the emulator at all. Uh, let's try SNES 9X. Uh, That one or yeah that one and here we go so it's loading oh is this oh, okay for a second I thought that was like a crack row or something no that's just how the intro is in FF5 I'm not super familiar with this game but this is a game that very famously did not come to the US initially um, so we're just going to start this. I'll just uh, fast forward so we can get to some text. Okay, here we go. So, here is some text. Now, 
if we go back into settings, accessibility, AI services, uh, we can look at the different options. So this is image mode. So if you press your, uh, your uh, command hotkey that you've set up, it'll start translating. You'll see there is something strange in the wind. I must go to the wind temple to find the crystal. So that is one option you can use. Um, the other option you can use is speech mode, which as the name suggests, let's just fast forward a bit. Uh, you can fast forward a little more. Oh, oops. almost got it. <laughs> there, that should be good. The wind has stopped. Is something wrong with Dad? And you'll see it narrates it. Now, I think there is a way to create an account so that you can customize this slightly. Um, I've not done that, and honestly, I've never really found a need to do that, but you can if you want. Um, I think doing that might also uh, cost money, so... It's up to you whether you want to actually uh, pay the money necessary to do that. But I've personally found that it's not actually all that necessary. So there's also a third option, narration mode. This one, I'm not entirely sure how it works uh, or if indeed it does. But I think what it's supposed to be able to do is kind of just consistently take information and bring it back so you don't have to keep using the hotkey. I've not gotten that to work. So I usually either just use text mode or image mode. And what you use kind of depends, what you should use kind of depends on one, your personal preference and two, whatever the game is. Like, if you're trying to, like, read and navigate, like, a, a, a menu or an inventory screen or something like that, you're going to want to use image mode. Um, but if you are just reading text like I was just doing, uh, you can use either image mode or speech mode depending on what your preference is. So... One last thing to kind of, I guess, sort of temper expectations slightly. As you've seen, this is a pretty impressive piece of software. However, if you do have a fan-translated thing, as you've seen, I have several in many languages that I could not begin to uh, parse any more than the Japanese original... Uh, but if there is a decent uh, fan translation in whatever language is preferable to you, um, I would recommend just using that. Most of the time, they are free. Worst case scenario, you just have to IPS patch it. But if it's a more obscure game, maybe a game that many people might not care about, uh, maybe a game that is... You know, like an RPG that's going to take several years and a lot of manpower to accurately translate. Um, then this is a pretty handy tool. Uh, just the way that translation works, you know, it's more than just translating the text. It's getting the nuance correct. It's turning phrases so that they scan properly in your desired language. Uh, there's a lot of nuance to just translating in general. Uh, and it, it's the same with, like, learning a new language, isn't it? You know, like, you kind of have to not just know what the words are, but, you know, what is appropriate, what scans properly in a certain culture or a certain language. So, on that note, this is still a really cool 
piece of software. Uh, it turns many games that might be unplayable to different uh, people of different languages and makes them playable. So I think that is really cool and it's really nice that that's able to be done with AI. So thank you guys so very much for watching. Bye everyone.